this video, we're talking about CPU performance measures. How do we measure performance? The book uses an analogy to compare airplane performance. Which airplane performs better depends on what you mean by performance. If you measure passenger capacity, the 747 would be best. If you're measuring cruising range, the DC-850 is best. If measuring cruising speed, the Concorde wins. The Concorde, by the way, was retired in 2003. And finally, if you make up a metric like passengers times miles per hour, the 747 is best. In a similar way, measuring CPU performance depends on what you mean by performance. One measure we could make for performance is response time or execution time. Let's say we start a timer, run a program, and then stop the timer measuring the execution time. One problem with this is that the operating system may be doing other things in the background that affect the time, so an average of runs is probably better. Another measure is throughput or bandwidth. How much work a computer got done in a set unit of time. If we want to compare two systems, we can divide the times to get relative performance. For example, if computer A got a task done in 15 seconds and computer B got the same task done in 10 seconds, we would divide 15 by 10 to show the relative performance of 1.5. Let's think about how response time and throughput would be affected by 1. replacing the processor with a faster version or two, adding more processors. Replacing the processor with a faster processor would affect response time and also get better throughput. Adding more processors wouldn't make any one program's response time faster, unless it was programmed for parallel processing, but it would definitely improve throughput. I like to think of this like lanes on a highway. If you have one lane, you can measure the response time the time it takes a car to get from point A to point B. Now increase throughput by adding more lanes. It will still take the same amount of time for a car to get from point A to point B, but you can get more cars through. You have increased throughput. The clock cycle is the time for one clock period of the CPU, which for now we'll think of as a constant rate. An example CPU clock cycle or period might be 250 picoseconds, and this corresponds to 4 GHz clock rate. The clock cycle and clock rate are inverses of each other. Here's some common measures of time. In everyday life, we're familiar with seconds. A thousandth of a second is called a millisecond. A millionth is called a microsecond. A billionth is called a nanosecond. And a trillionth is called a picosecond. Hertz is a measure of frequency. It's cycles per second, the inverse of the cycle period. So one hertz is one cycle per period. A kilohertz is a thousand. A megahertz is a million. A gigahertz is a billion. And a terahertz is a trillion. This is the initial formula we look at to measure CPU time. The time it takes to execute a program depends on the number of clock cycles that it takes times the clock cycle time. Since clock cycle time and clock rate are inverses of each other, we can also express this idea as the number of clock cycles divided by the clock rate. We could improve CPU performance by either reducing the number of clock cycles or increasing the clock rate. As it turns out, these are very intertwined. CPU design is often a trade-off between the clock rate and the clock cycle count. We can break down the number of clock cycles into two components. The instruction count, and here we mean machine language instructions, times the cycles per instruction. So now our formula is modified slightly. CPU time is the instruction count times the CPI, the average cycles per instruction, either times the clock cycle time or divided by the clock rate. The instruction count is going to be determined by the program, the instruction set architecture of the machine language, as well as the compiler. The CPI, the average cycles per instruction, 
That's determined by the CPU hardware. Let's plug in some numbers to see how the formulas work. Computer A has half the cycle time of computer B, but it has a higher CPI, cycles per instruction. Plugging into the formula, we see that B is actually 1.2 times faster than A, despite A's very short cycle time. Different instructions may take different number of clock cycles, so a weighted average is calculated for CPI. Here again is our formula. Our CPU time depends on the number of instructions, machine language instructions in a program, times the number of clock cycles per instruction, times the seconds per clock cycle. I like to think of this as a long balloon. If you press down and reduce one portion, other portions are naturally going to pop up. There's always a trade-off. The algorithm that you choose to solve a problem affects the instruction count, and that in turn could affect the average CPI. The choice of programming language affects the instruction count in the CPI, as does the compiler. The instruction set architecture itself affects all components, the instruction count, the average cycles per instruction, and the clock cycle time, since the clock cycle time and the ISA have to be designed together. CPUs became more powerful and faster by adding more transistors. Moore's law enabled this. But when you add more transistors, the CPU uses more power. This chart from 1982 to 2012 shows how improvements in processor clock rates stalled when the power wall was hit. Adding more transistors past that point would not only use more power, but generate more heat, which would require additional cooling. CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor material, is used in making low power chips. Another benefit of this material is that it has high noise immunity. Here we see a simple inverter that has two transistors. This logic device will draw the most power when switching states, but it's going to use power all of the time. This is just a simple example of how increasing the number of transistors increases the power. You may remember the term joule from physics class. The joule is a derived unit of energy in the international system of units. It's equal to the energy transferred to an object when a force of one newton acts on the object in the direction of the force's motion through a distance of one meter. A more familiar metric is watts, which is joules per second. The power issue became even more important as mobile devices became more prominent. Power has to dissipate as heat, and this heat has to be cooled, causing even more power usage. And this help explains how the power wall limited how fast uniprocessors could get. In an earlier chart, we saw the limitations on processor speed imposed by the power wall. This chart from 1978 to 2014 shows the gains in many different processors. In the range from about 1986 to 2003, over 50% a year improvement was made up until the power wall. Because of the power wall, CPU designers changed from designing uniprocessors to putting more than one processor or core on a chip. A multi-core processor, also called a multiprocessor, has more than one core per chip. All modern computers have multi-core processors. How can we exploit this parallel architecture? One way is through concurrency do many different things at the same time. Operating systems take advantage of parallel hardware to implement concurrency. Another approach is parallelism, dividing a problem into units that can be run at the same time on different processors. Here we see some CPU frequencies from recent Intel i7 and i5 chips. The turbo boost dynamically kicks in when heat is low. So for example, in the i7, the max clock rate is 4.2 GHz. If the system detects that the temperature is too high, 
it will scale back down to its base clock rate of 1.9 GHz until the system is cooled. SPEC, the System Performance Evaluation Cooperative, is a nonprofit organization that compiles sets of benchmark programs to fairly compare CPUs. Programs are selected to be typical workloads and have minimal or no I.O. since I.O. is a system issue and not a CPU issue. A given CPU's performance is compared to a reference machine and summarized as a geometric mean of the relative performance ratios. Here we see a spec evaluation of the Intel i7. Each row indicates a different program in the benchmark set and what we see as we go across is really our CPU time formula again. I times CPI times clock cycles. And this gives us our execution time. The execution time for each program is compared to a reference time for a baseline computer. And these are divided to get the relative performance, which is the spec ratio in the last column. Finally, at the bottom right, we see the geometric mean over all of these benchmark programs. What this is saying is that the i7 is 25.7 times faster than the baseline CPU. SPEC also does power benchmarks. This is especially important for servers. Right now, Intel has the lion's share of the server market. AMD has tried to get in the market, but I think the greatest competition in the future will come from ARM-based servers that are coming into the market. The thing to notice here is that the power doesn't scale down linearly. At 100%, we're using 258 watts. At 50%, we're using 170 watts. That's about two-thirds, 66% of the maximum, not half. And even all the way down to 10%, it's using 120 watts, which is 46% of the maximum. Google data centers operate mostly at 10 to 50% load, and it's at 100% load less than 1% of the time. But we see here that it's even going to have to use a lot of power, even at low loads. MDAL's law can quantify an overall system improvement for an improvement in one area. This is one version of MDAL's law. There are different variations of the formula. This formula from our book isolates the affected improvement over the portion that's not affected. For example, consider that some application has 40% floating point multiply instructions. If you could make that multiply five times faster, how does this impact the overall performance? We take our affected time, the 40, and divide it by our improvement factor of five. Adding that to the unaffected time gives us 68. So this proposed improvement would result in execution of only 68% of the original time. There's another metric that you sometimes still see on manufacturers' websites called MIPS. This has nothing to do with our MIPS. It's a metric that means millions of instructions per second. As our book points out, MIPS is not a good metric because it doesn't account for differences in instruction set architectures and how long instructions take to execute. For example, RISC architectures like ARM and MIPS will execute many more instructions quite a bit faster than CISC architectures like the x86. So this metric is meaningless. The good news for us is that processor costs are going down and performance is going up. The instruction set architecture influences how many instructions are executed and how fast they are. The ISA and hardware are designed together when designing a CPU. To compare relative performance of CPUs, we use execution time, often in benchmark sets. Power has been a limiting factor in how fast CPUs can get. Multiprocessors have greatly improved performance. Music